So welcome back to Constitutional Law 1, or Criminal Procedure, um, Criminal Law 1, Criminal Procedure. Uh, today we're discussing Terry Stops and Reasonable Suspicion. All right, so up until this point, we've looked at the need to have probable cause to conduct a search, a seizure, et cetera. What we're gonna see is there are large caveats to those requirements. So let's jump in. Like anything, we have to start with the text that grants us the right, right? So in this case, we're dealing with the Fourth Amendment. So this should be familiar by now, but in case it's not, I've highlighted and underlined the important parts that deal with Terry stops and reasonable suspicion. Right, so the right of the people to be secure in their persons against unreasonable searches and seizures. Right? And then we go on to say, shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation. But what we're really focused on is you're secure in your person from unreasonable searches and seizures. And if you recall from previous lectures, when we conduct a search without a warrant, it's de facto unreasonable, right? And then once it's challenged, it's on the prosecution to prove that the search met one of the exceptions for warrantless searches or something along those lines. Now today's focus is gonna be a little bit more on the seizure of a person um, and the search of a person, uh, just shy of arrest. So let's jump in. Okay, so when does a seizure occur, right, of a, of a person? So under the Fourth Amendment, a seizure occurs when an officer detains a person and restricts his or her freedom of movement. Right, so I'll say that again. When an officer detains a person and restricts his or her freedom of movement. Right? The idea is you're not free to leave. A seizure has occurred, right? So this can be a formal arrest. This can be getting pulled over for speeding, right? If you get pulled over for speeding, you can't just speed, you can't just drive off. A seizure has occurred. So even with speeding tickets, um, or arrests, the Fourth Amendment is implicated. Now, that being said, when we think about the Fourth Amendment, right, and, and we've talked about this in some detail, the greater the intrusion um, upon a person and the greater the restriction on the individual's freedom of movement, the greater the justification is required. Right, so obviously there is um, a big difference between somebody just stopping you on the street and talking to you versus putting you in handcuffs, right? So the greater the intrusion, the greater the restriction, the more justification that we have to have. So it kind of makes sense. Now we've broken seizures or, or interactions with police into three different categories, right? So the first category are called encounters. These are the completely voluntary stops in which an individual is free to leave and is not seized. All right, so if you're walking down the street, the police officer says, hey, can I talk to you for a second? You can just keep on walking. Um, the, probably the best thing to do is ask the officer, am I free to leave? And we're gonna see that becomes really important when we're talking about the Miranda rights. Right, um, you know, the right to remain silent, all that stuff. So again, encounters, you're free to leave. The, the police can't stop you, detain you, whatever. Um, they can ask you questions. I mean, if you engage and you voluntarily participate, that's on you. Um, otherwise, you don't have to, right? So this is kind of harkening back to um, previous lecture when I discussed uh, subway and, and the police in the subway, right, uh, in, in Boston. Um, theoretically, while they were standing there and telling people, oh, uh, you need to go over there and get your bag searched, 
um, this was voluntary, right? Again, my friend didn't walk through and like told the officer what he could do with himself. Um, it was an encounter. Like the officer got pissed, but there's nothing the officer could do. So an encounter is when you the individual is free to leave, right? So no seizure has occurred. Right, so you haven't been restricted in your freedom of movement. If we go a little bit higher, we move into something called Terry stops. Now, Terry derives from a case, um, Terry v. Ohio, uh, that we'll talk about in, in, in some detail. But a Terry stop. Uh, often referred to as, and you might hear another term, is a stop and frisk. They are brief investigatory stops in which the individual would generally not feel free to leave and is thus seized. All right, so this is, um, please say stop um, or come here or give some kind of command that would make you feel like you were not free to leave, right? That if you left, then you're talking, you're, you're evading and, and fleeing and, and things like that. So again, this is a brief investigatory stop. So the whole idea behind Terry stops is police should be allowed to, if, if they observe suspicious conduct, right? Um, they should be allowed to stop a person, not that person's not free to go, but they're not in handcuffs or anything, and then ask them what they're doing, right? Just to investigate to see if a crime is being committed or if this person is a person who committed a crime. So in order to effectuate a Terry stop, we have to have what's called reasonable suspicion. All right, so compare that to encounters. Encounters, we don't, have to have any kind of suspicion, right? The encounter is you're freely engaging with the officer. A Terry stop is brief, right? And we'll talk about how long they can last, but generally speaking, it's brief. Um, officer asks a few questions. You're not really free to leave, so you're seized. And since you're seized, we require a little bit more um, in terms of uh, the, the, the baseline to hold you, right? So we require reasonable suspicion. Reasonable suspicion, when well, we talked about this a couple of times um, throughout the course, is basically this notion of you have some kind of articulable reason um, that a reasonable person would uh, consider s suspicious. Right? So you have to have some kind of articulable reason. It can't just be at random. Um, what we've seen, in, especially in New York City, this has become a, this was a major issue. Um, reasonable suspicion has been not necessarily the driving force behind Terry stops, uh, especially when it comes to stops of African Americans. So police would do a Terry stop and every time they saw somebody that they knew had committed a crime in the past or, or they maybe profiled and didn't have a reasonable suspicion, they didn't have an articulable reason, they had a hunch and they, committed, and they infatuated a Terry stop. Um, that is illegal, right? And so that would lead to the suppression of any evidence that they found uh, deriving from a Terry stop. Now, here's where Terry stops get interesting. So not only during a Terry stop, if we have reasonable suspicion, is an officer free to um, seize you, stop you, but the officer is permitted um, to conduct a search. Now that search is limited to what's called a protective frisk. Right, and so the idea behind the protective frisk is um, you're talking to the officer, officer makes sure for his safety, he just pats you down, 
right? And so it, it's not necessarily as invasive as a search when you're arrested or anything along those lines. They're just looking theoretically for firearms um, or, or some other weapon. Now, what we'll see and talk about in a while is protective frisks um, invoke the plain feel doctrine, right? So um, in some states, not all states, but in some states, we've interpreted this plain feel doctrine um, to, to mean that if the officer is frisking somebody that they just stopped briefly to, to ask a couple questions and they find, they feel what's called a firearm on them. Well, then they, and the person shouldn't have a firearm, can have a firearm. Um, they can take the firearm if the person is allowed to have it. They, they can take it and, and, and hold it so that the um, person doesn't use it. Um, if the person's not allowed to have a firearm, let's say they're a former felon, well, then we can make an arrest, right? Um, because we did a protective frisk and then we had the plain field doctrine. Now, what we're going to see is the plain field doctrine has been interesting um, in terms of how it's been applied uh, beyond firearms or weapons. Um, so what we'll see is, is basically if an officer can identify something as contraband, right? So if they feel the outside of your pockets, they can't go inside the pockets usually, but if they feel the outside of your pockets, and they feel something that they immediately know is drugs or suspect to be drugs, then they can go in your pockets, pull out the drugs, and then make an arrest, right? Even though the whole point of this protective frisk is to protect the officer, um, not to discover a crime or, 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 or arrest somebody. It's just there to protect the officer. So we'll get into that in a little bit later. Then the third level of interactions, right, encounters being the least intrusive, Terry stops being in the middle, and then the most intrusive is an arrest, right? So an arrest occurs when an individual is seized, taken into custody, and is not free to leave, right? So we'll see that the line between Terry stops and arrests uh, get a little blurred, but generally Terry stops, remember, they're supposed to be brief investigatory stops, whereas an arrest, you're taken into custody. It's not brief. Um, you're not free to leave. Usually we're talking handcuffs. Terry stops, we don't usually do handcuffs. Um, so it, it, it is a, a definitely more severe seizure. Now, we'll cover arrests in a later class, but arrests generally require probable cause, right? And so we've talked about probable cause and thought about probable cause on a spectrum, right? So if we think about this spectrum, um, on one end, we have 0% certainty something happened, right? Or something is going on, or it's just 0%. On the other end of the spectrum, we have 95 or 100%, excuse me, um, certainty that somebody is committed a crime or is committing a crime or, or what have you, right? So there's the spectrum, zero to 100. We've said that probable cause is 50.01% or 51% or 50% plus a feather, right? So just a teeny bit more likely than not that the person's committed a crime or something along those lines, right? Um, that's probable cause. And that's to make an arrest. That's a, that's a fairly low bar. So think about that in terms of Terry stops. Terry stops just require reasonable suspicion. So if we're looking at our spectrum between zero and 100, Terry stops are probably around 15 to 25% sure um, somebody's doing something they're not supposed to. Right? And again, it, it has to be more than a hunch. You have to have some kind of good articulable reason, but it doesn't have to reach the probable cause threshold. It doesn't have to be more likely than not. It's just, huh, that's kind of suspicious. That's all it takes. Right? So um, Terry stops, very, um, very reduced requirements in terms of what officers need to do in order to proceed with the stop. Now, 
how do we define when a seizure occurs, right? So again, how do we define when you are not free to leave? So we come back to the theme throughout this course of a totality of the circumstances, right? So a seizure is based upon the totality of the circumstances. So again, this is similar to how we determine if there's probable cause or how we determine if consent has been given to conduct a search. We say here, um, would a reasonable person under the totality of the circumstances feel like they were free to leave? Right? So um, again, this is a reasonable person standard, but we base it upon everything that's happening. Right, everything that was known to the officer, everything that was known to the, the person in question, the location, the time of day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so um, again, this is, this is the totality of the circumstances test where you have to look at everything. Um, now, generally, there are two forms of seizures. There is the physical seizure, and then there's the show of authority seizure. Physical seizure, seizures um, is basically when law enforcement physically holds or retains the person from leaving, right? So physical seizure is handcuffs, right? Or putting you in the patrol car, right? So they're physically stopping you, they're physically restraining you. Now that's usually the, the easiest one to recognize, right? Um, if the handcuffs are out, you're probably not free to leave. Um, you can't just say, hey, take the handcuffs off me, I'm, I don't wanna go. Um, that's not how that works. So physical seizures are, are, are fairly easy to delineate. Right? What becomes more difficult are the show of authority seizures. Right? In a show of authority seizure, the officer demonstrates their authority. So they may say, halt. They may display a weapon. They may do something that would lead a reasonable person to believe they were not free to leave, right? So this isn't, we are physically touching you. This can be stop, halt, um, which is different than come here, right? Um, or, or can I talk to you? Come here is probably on the same lines of halt, but can I talk to you is not, right? There's no authority in can I talk to you? That's just an encounter. But as soon as we have this demonstration of authority, right, a show of authority seizure, um, again, in, in the form of a halt or display of a weapon or what have you, we ask, would a, this lead a reasonable person to believe they were not free to leave? Um, so there are some really great cases uh, that um, I've had you all read, and I hope that you've read them. Um, because they they are really just fascinating. Um, it, 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 it's, it is really, really fascinating on um, how we've determined different things, right? Um, one book that I didn't have you buy, but I highly recommend if you're kind of interested in the backstories behind these cases, uh, is called Criminal Procedure Stories. And it looks at some of the major cases that we deal with in, in this class in criminal procedure. And it gives you the backstory. Like, so you get the facts, right? That, uh, and then the opinion. This gives you what led to the facts, right? Um, this gives you people's backgrounds and, and gives you the story. Um, it's a really good book. It's definitely would help you study. Um, because it does more than just tell you the story. It tells you how the Supreme Court dealt with it and, and, and all that jazz. So that being said, um, there's a few cases that, that kind of deal with this demonstration of authority. Um, the first case that you read would have been Immigration and Naturalization Services, so INS, versus Delgado. And this is a 1984 case. And what this dealt with was factory sweeps, right? So basically, 
INS would go into factories, or this in particular, this factory, and they would um, ask people for documentation that they were legally here, right? Um, now, there, there, there are a couple of different ways that this has been effectuated. So one way is um, INS agents go physically into the factory and get people, stop people from working to question them. And generally speaking, we're gonna say, yeah, that's probably, um, probably a, a, a physical seizure um, if the person was not able to walk away, right? Um, and and it, it's it's a difficult case in, in the sense of, of I don't necessarily it opens up a lot of questions right um, so you know if INS agents come into your workplace and you're on a factory assembly line are you generally free just to walk away well no um, because you are a part of this assembly line the assembly line doesn't stop right at the same time. Who is keeping you from walking away? Is it the police, or in this case, the federal agents? Or is it your boss, right? So remember, the show of authority seizure has to be from the government, from the police, from the federal agent, not from you not wanting to get fired or something along those lines. And con contrast that to when INS agents would stand outside of factories. And as people came out, they asked them for their papers, right? So in that case, are you a little bit more free to leave? Well, it just depends upon the circumstances, right? Totality of the circumstances, what we all know. Um, you know, if they block the exit, then, you know, may maybe not. If there's another exit you can take, you know, then, they probably haven't seized you, right? You've, you've engaged in an encounter. Um, but again, the idea here was kind of like you could walk away from assembly line, which we all know is not true, but it's not the police keeping you from the assembly line. It's the, the, the boss, right? And so if you walk away from the assembly line, you might lose your job, but you're not going to jail, right? That's kind of like the alternative um, uh, or get deported, right? So um, if we fast forward a little bit to United States versus Drayton, this was a bus sweep. Um, and so basically what happens in United States versus Drayton is uh, this involves the, the Uh, federal agents and, and, and involves, if I recall correctly, a Greyhound bus. Um, and in this case, uh, what police do um, is they, well, I should say this way. Okay. Um, the Drayton was traveling on a passenger bus, so like a Greyhound bus, right? Uh, and then the bus was stopped for a routine search by three police officers, right? So routine search by three police officers. Now, two of the officers were up front um, by the exit, by the door, uh, and one proceeded down the aisle and started engaging passengers in conversation. Now, according to the testimony, uh, the passengers were not required to cooperate. So the passengers didn't have to say or speak to the officers if they didn't want to. However, the police did not inform the passengers of this fact. And in fact, when we talk about Drayton, and there was actually another respondent, um, Brown, they were seated next to each other. The officer informed them um, in a voice that was just loud enough for them to hear, so he didn't say it, bark it, or anything like that, um, that he was part of an interdiction effort. Um, so trying to find drugs, right? And he asked if they had any bags. 
when one indicated a bag above them, the officer actually requested permission to check it, which they granted. The officers didn't find anything in the bag. So the officers requested to check um, Brown's person. Brown granted permission. During the pat down, the officer detected um, hard packages similar to those used in the detection of drugs. Brown was taken into custody. And when officers asked Drayton, um, Drayton raised his hands about eight inches above his legs, and the officers found similar packages. So they took Drayton into custody, and upon further searching, they found him to be carrying very sizable amounts of cocaine. So the question here kind of comes into play of, okay, when police officers were doing this, right, was it an encounter? Was it a Terry stop or was it an arrest? Now, in this case, um, we are kind of looking at, from the reasonable person standard, remember, if a reasonable person would feel free to terminate the encounter, they have not been seized. And we have to look at the totality of the circumstances. Um, so in this case, right, there was really no show of, of, of force um, in the sense that the officers voluntarily engaged people in conversation. Now, the officers didn't tell people that they could say no or that they didn't have to speak to them. But there was no halts, there was no guns taken out, anything along those lines, right? And the Supreme Court, in a decision, a decision I completely disagree with, said it was an encounter. And what Drayton did and in, in, in showing him the drugs and all that jazz um, was perfectly legal because it was just an encounter. Now, I would argue that we're probably having a Terry stop. Um, but the problem is, is it was a routine inspection, right? Um, so there's hard to say there's articulable suspicion. But if you have two police officers basically blocking the front door of the bus, and then another officer going down the bus, talking to people, or you feel like you're gonna free to leave, right? So maybe you, the, par the person, the officer gets past you, you decide to get up, are you gonna be allowed to go through those two officers? Is a reasonable person gonna feel like they're allowed to go between those two officers? And the Supreme Court said, yeah, right? That the, this was fine, that the basically the, 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 the police did not have to warn um, bus passengers or to tell them that they were free to go. So that is, again, not a, um, a, a, a seizure, at least as the Supreme Court interpreted it. Now, do I agree? Absolutely not. But that's just how it is, right? Um, one day when I'm on the Supreme Court, I'll change it. But until then, uh, there's not much I can do. So that brings us now to Michigan versus Chest, Chester Nut. Um, also a very interesting case um, because it dealt with vehicle surveillance, right? Um, so specifically in, in this case, uh, what happens is, is police officers, um, uh, basically just tail someone, right? Um, I mean, they, 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 they don't make any kind of, um, they, don't, they don't try to hide it, right? So basically they observed a, 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 a trying to think how to word this. So from their vehicle, right, from the police officer's vehicle. Um, police were on this routine patrol, and when they were patrolling, um, and this is similar to uh, California versus Ordari, um, basically when they're patrolling, they, the guy sees them and takes off running, and this is true in both cases. The guy sees them and takes off running. Um, 
and the police decided to follow right in their cop car to see where he was going. Um, when they caught up with him, they drove alongside him for a short distance and they observed him discarding a number of packets. Okay. Now, all right, we're having this point now of you running from police and you're throwing stuff on the ground, right? So um, what they did is they surmised um, that, uh, they stopped him, um, that surmising the pills subsequently discovered in the packets contained codeine, the officers arrested him, after a search of his person revealed drugs and a hypodermic needle, they charged him with controlled substance under violation of Michigan law. Now, the Supreme Court said that the officer's pursuit of the respondent, the, the suspect, did not constitute a seizure, so it did not implicate Fourth Amendment protections. Um, it, it was interesting um, because it's kind of a catch-22, right? Um, if you're fleeing from police, and that's kind of what the, 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 uh, the court hinged on, was if you're fleeing from police, then do you feel like you have the, a reasonable person would feel like they're free to leave? Um, well, yeah, you, dis you demonstrated that you were free to leave because you started running, right? Um, the problem is when the police officers see you running, when they, you see them and they take up running, that gives them reasonable suspicion, right? I mean, that, that's enough to be like, yeah, there's some, like maybe something here. Again, it's 25, 15% uncertainty. And of course, then seeing him drop the packets, that, that gets them up definitely to um, probable cause, right? So the question really becomes, you know, when the police were following him, um, was, was that uh, uh, a seizure? And, and again, the answer is, is, is no, because one, the person wasn't seized, obviously, because the person ran. Um, and, and, and two, a reasonable person in that situation um, might think like, oh, I'm not free to leave, but the problem is, is you ran. So you obviously thought you were free to leave. Um, but it kind of manifests the other thing as well, right? The other side. Um, if you felt like you were free to leave, then there'd be no reason to run, right? And no reason to get away from the police. So like I said, it's, it's a really kind of a, a catch-22. Um, so basically what they, they did looking at the totality of the circumstances to see if they restrained his liberty. Um, they determined that he was not seized before he discarded the drug packets, right? One officer's characterization of police conduct as a chase alone, standing alone, is insufficient to implicate the Fourth Amendment. Um, since police conduct, uh, which in this case, a uh, brief acceleration to catch up with him, and follow him for a short distance, would have not communicated to a reasonable person an attempt to capture him or otherwise intrude upon his freedom. So then the question actually kind of becomes when they, and, and this becomes in, in Rondi, um, when they chase somebody on foot, right? Are they are under arrest? Are they, or is the Fourth Amendment implicated? And the answer again is, is, is no. Um, if you're running from police and they haven't done anything to restrict your freedom of movement, then you haven't been seized, right? And keep in mind, that's where we're looking at is, has your freedom of movement been altered in some way, right? Restricted by the police. And that's why I don't like the Drayton case, because I argue that, yeah, your freedom of movement was restricted. There was two officers blocking the door, right? Um, but... Again, it, it, it's not how they came out. Um, so again, that's what we're looking for, especially in Chesternut and then Harandi, uh, Harad, Haradi, Harad, Harad, I can never say it. Um, basically, fleeing the police, right? Uh, and, and, and generally speaking, the question is, are you seized? And, and 
No, if you're running, you're not seized, right? Your freedom of movement has been restricted. Um, when they chase you on foot, that might be a little bit different, right? Um, because you can't turn around <laughs> without being seized. Um, but usually in, in these cases, what we've seen is um, people discarding drug packets and things like that. Well, that's enough to give somebody probable cause, right? Which is enough to arrest them and stop them. So that's kind of how these cases have played out. Now, this brings us to um, a little bit more detail of Terry stops, also called stop and frisks. So this kind of, uh, if, you, if you see this first bullet, um, the terms that are in quotation marks are very important, right? So in some circumstances, it may be appropriate to seize someone absent probable cause to investigate a crime or suspected criminal activity, right? So if we think about um, what we're doing here, right? Um, this kind of goes back to our balance of, of, of freedom versus safety, right? We, we want maximum rights, but we also want to be free or, or safe. So how does that play out in real life, right? Um, so we want to be able to stop suspects or somebody that we think is about to commit a crime or is engaged in criminal activity. We want to stop them but we don't have probable cause. We don't have enough to say it's more likely than not they're doing something, but we have a reason that's again, articulable and beyond a hunch. Um, so what we end up seeing is, uh, uh, and this culminates in Terry versus Ohio, right? This is where we get the term Terry stop from. So, Basically, uh, and this is actually a story that's in the criminal procedure stories book, uh, a Cleveland detective, name was McFadden, um, was, had patrolled the downtown beat for several years. Okay? Um, he observed Terry and another man on a street corner. He then saw them proceed um, alternate, alternately um, back and forth along an incidental route. Right. And basically what they were doing is there's two guys on the corner. They were walking back and forth, observing a store, right? observing a shop. Um, and they did this 24 times. Um, so each time that they would complete their route, the two people, the two uh, suspects in this case, would stop and they'd talk. And then the next person would go and look, and again, 24 times. Now, the officer observed all of this, right? Um, and what he, the officer suspected is, is fair, I, I think, I think, I think a, thing, a fair uh, thing to suspect, um, was that they were casing the, 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 the store, right? They were going to do a stick up. They were going to do some kind of theft. So um, basic officer kind of followed them um, and they were a few blocks away and they were in front of the store. The officer approached them. There was a third person at this point. Um, he identified himself as an officer and asked them their names. The men mumbled something whereupon McFadden spun Terry around patted down the outside of his clothing, and in his overcoat pocket, um, he, was on a, he, he found a pistol. Um, the officer ordered the three into the store. He removed the petitioner's overcoat and took the revolver, ordered the three to face the wall with their hands raised, patted down the outer clothing, um, and seized another revolver. Um, he did not put his hands under the outer garments um, of, of the suspects, right? So he just left it to the outer garments. He didn't go deeper. 
And so this kind of raises the question of uh, what's going on, right? Um, and and ultimately, it kind of comes down to like, what was the, the were the pistols were they able to be put into evidence, right? Um, because were they arrested? What, what was going on? Um, what he did was arguably a, 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 and is a stop and frisk, right? Um, the stop would be a show of authority, right? That you would not feel free to leave. So we know right there, as soon as he tells them to stop, um, there's a show of authority, they're not free to leave, so we have to have at least reasonable suspicion to order them to stop and then to pat them down. And this is what Terry versus Ohio says, right? So in this case, um, was there reasonable suspicion? No, yeah, they were acting suspicious as hell. Was there a seizure? Yes, right? When the officer said halt, that was a seizure. And then when he finds the pistols, then he has probable cause to make the arrest. Right, so you kind of see it, it builds upon each other, right? Um, some stuff we get by probable cause right away, some stuff we kind of have to build up to get probable cause to make the arrest. So Terrier versus Ohio kind of comes out and the Supreme Court stamps it basically and says, all right, if there's reasonable suspicion, we'll allow Terry stops. Now keep in mind, this is 1968, right? So this is during the criminal justice revolution. This is around the time that Miranda v. Arizona comes out and a whole slew of cases that provide protections for um, people who are charged with crimes or, or could potentially be charged with crimes, et cetera. So this kind of deviates from their, their, their pattern. The pattern was more bright rights, give rights, give rights, give rights, give rights. And in Terry versus Ohio, they kind of looked at it and were like, okay, let's be reasonable here. Um, yes, you have these rights, but we need to balance safety versus individual freedoms. So again, the circumstances required what we call reasonable suspicion under the totality of the circumstances, right? So based on the facts known to the officers at the time, would a reasonable uh, person believe uh, that the action taken was appropriate? Right? So generally speaking, it has to be an articulable suspicion, right? not a hunch. And we do this as an objective determination. So we don't just say, well, that officer, he, he, he had some kind of suspicion. No, we say, is it objectively reasonable? Like, would society accept that as a reasonable suspicion? In addition, right, the court tells us that the suspicion must be particularized, right? So we can't just stop a whole group of people because they're in a group of people. Maybe they're acting suspicious, or one person's acting suspicious, and we decided to detain somebody else. No, the suspicion has to be particularized, right? We have to say, this person did X, Y, and Z. That gave me reason to believe they were committing a crime, and go from there, right? You can't just say, well, I know that people of this ethnicity in this area um, are often charged with burglaries, so I stop the person, right? And if we say, if we use that as an example, is there an articulable suspicion? Well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, there, there, there is a, a racial component here, and the Supreme Court's told us that we can use race, right, as one factor, but it has to be among others. So maybe there's some particular suspicion, maybe there's not. But if there's an articulable suspicion, question is then, is it particularized? In our example of we have people of a certain race in a certain area are commonly charged with burglary, and that's why you stop this one person, that's not particularized, right? Unless you have something, some reason that this person did something that was suspicious. They're just walking down the street, generally speaking, it, it's not gonna be enough. Uh, we'll talk about how race comes into play a little bit later, um, but 
it has to be particularized, right? So again, we do it under uh, chatted circumstances. And remember, this is based upon probabilities, not certainties. So what factors support reasonable suspicion? Obviously, number one is criminal activity. If officer sees people engaged in criminal activity, uh, that can be one factor that supports reasonable suspicion. Time, all right? So if you have a couple guys outside a store and the store is closed because it's 2 a.m. and they're just kind of like hanging out around the front, that's suspicious because it's 2 a.m. Like, why aren't you in bed? The store is closed. Um, location. So high crime neighborhoods can, again, usually we're going to have some other factors, but can be one of the factors that um, gives us reasonable suspicion. Another one, um, which actually does come from Perry versus Ohio, because McFadden actually had a history with um, one of the gentlemen, um, is criminal record, right? So if an officer knows somebody has a criminal record, that might be enough, depending on the totality of the circumstances, everything that's happening, um, that might be enough to say this person is being suspicious, right? So let's say that we're back to the example of the store being closed and two guys are out in front of it at 2 a.m. And the officer knows one is John Smith and knows that John Smith has been arrested for burglary four or five times. Okay, well then suddenly just hanging out when it's closed, that's suspicious enough, but wait, this person also has a criminal record for what we think may be happening, right? So again, the more of these factors we have, the better. Um, we also have evasion, right? So again, Illinois versus Wardlow, uh, basically you see the police officer and you take off running or you try to slip down the height, you, know, you do whatever you have to do. Um, Evasion is, is, is enough, right? To be like, okay, we need to stop this person and talk to them in the very least because that's really weird, right? Like, like if, if, if you're not, and the, the, the idea behind this, which it's not necessarily the most sound reasoning, is if you aren't doing something wrong or doing something illegal, then you're probably not gonna run from police. Now, that's a very, white male view, um, right? White male, middle and upper class view. Um, as we've seen, right, there, there are problems um, with officers and, and, and again, not the majority, but, but there are some officers who um, definitely enforce laws based upon race. Um, and they don't want to get shot, right? I mean, so think about some of the things that are happening now. Um, if you were a minority in, in some uh, in like Portland or something like that right now, um, would you feel if you saw a police officer safe or would you think that you need to run? Um, you know, so that they don't hurt you or something along those lines. So evasion is getting a little bit more tricky, but again, that's it. Remember, the Supreme Court made basically all white males for throughout history, um, with the exception of like two women, and, and, and now we've got more, and, 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 and we're a little bit more diverse, but this is the take, right? If you didn't do anything wrong, you wouldn't be running. And it's like, well, if you're a white middle class person, yeah, probably. Um, if you are a minority, where officers are the enemy, maybe they brutalized friends or whatever, Maybe you do have a reason to run away from them, right? That isn't suspicious. Uh, another way of getting reasonable suspicion, and this is really crappy, is non-cooperation, right? So remember encounters, right? The encounter is not a stop, right? Your freedom of movement is not restricted. The officer just asks you, hey, can you come here for a second? Uh, can I ask you a couple questions? And you say no. Is that enough to get us reasonable suspicion? I mean, the idea is, well, if, if you had nothing to hide, you'd come talk to the police officers. Again, another very much white middle-class view. Um, 
we will consider non-cooperation, but again, invoking your rights is never enough to lead us to probable cause or reasonable suspicion. So non-cooperation, you can say no, and you're free to go. The officer, that's not generally enough to get reasonable suspicion, but the officers might follow you, right, on foot. You just see where you go, and what you do, observe you, um, which may restrict your freedom of movement, and, and then we get into Terry stops. Uh, but non-cooperation just on its own, without anything else, um, if it is constitutional, you have a constitutional right not to, is not generally enough to get us reasonable suspicion, unless it's coupled with something else, right, and again, something on this list. Um, and so if we have non-cooperation and maybe the demeanor is nervousness, okay, then maybe we're gonna say, something doesn't feel right here, I'm gonna stop you and we're gonna talk. Um, that being said, again, we have this white middle class view, right, that we're implying. Uh, Non-cooperation and demeanor. I am white middle class. I get nervous around police officers and I don't do anything. Like, I don't like leaving my house. So, it, yeah, I get nervous, right? And it's, it's because it, it, it is a tense situation. You have a man with a gun wanting to talk to you. Even think about driving down the highway. When you're driving down the highway, you slow down when you see a police officer, right? Why? Because we're instinctually nervous. We don't want to have to pay a fine. We don't want to have to do whatever. Um, so if you decide to not cooperate, but you're acting really nervous, that could be enough to be reasonable suspicion. Again, that's a white middle class view. If you're from a minority class or, or um, a lower class, non-cooperation, saying, no, I don't talk to you, and being nervous around a police officer may be well justified, right? And so, again, we judge it from kind of an objective standard. We also look at experience with the area, um, the individuals, and crimes. Uh, we deal with informants. So re recall that we have the, the two-pronged test for informants and determining whether or not there's they give us enough for probable cause. The same is true for reasonable suspicion. We have to go through those two factors. And then we have racial profiling. So can race be a factor in um, gathering reasonable suspicion? United States versus Weaver in the 1992 case tells us yes, and the Supreme Court hasn't overruled it. Um, Racial profiling is generally okay as long as it is one factor of many, right? So it, the, the impetus here is that race by itself is not reasonable suspicion. Race plus other factors has to be one among many. You can consider race, right? Um, so think about... Uh, a white affluent neighborhood and the officers know that virtually everyone in the neighborhood is white um, and a black man is walking down the street or walking down the, the, the sidewalk, not doing anything. Can officers do a Terry stop? Um, all they have is race. Like, no, they can't. But if, let's say, they know there's been criminal or there's been burglaries in the area, um, a black man has been cited in some of the burglaries, and the guy that's coming down the street has a criminal record, then can we do a Terry stop? Yeah, absolutely. Um, because, yes, was race part of it? That's kind of why they noticed, like, why is there a black guy in this white neighborhood? 
Um, was race a part of it? Yeah. But it was one factor among many, right? Um, actually, kind of harkens back to a client that I had. Um, this is the one where I made the state trooper cry. Uh, the state trooper was uh, driving down the road, and my client was, was uh, a black man. He was driving down the opposite side of the road, and he was in a very white part of town. Um, a very classy white part of this town. And officer spun around, right, pulled him over. And ultimately the guy gives him like permission to search the trunk. The guy finds like just a shit ton of heroin in it, right? Um, but the question is, did you have reasonable suspicion to stop that person? I just because they were black and they were in the wrong part of or in, in the wrong part in, in, in a part of town that is predominantly white. Because at this point, did he run the plates? No, he didn't have any information on their, the criminal record. Again, the location was white, but it was during the daytime. There was no evasion. I didn't like speed up. I um, wasn't throwing things out of his car. Anything along those lines. All right, and so this is the one where I got to cross-examine the state trooper and made him cry in front of his superiors. Um, because I basically started out with, so you're a racist, aren't you? Um, and, and, and that's where being a lawyer is kind of difficult uh, because did, was the officer um, trying to be racist? I actually, in this, this case, not every case, but in this case, um, I legitimately don't think so. Right, I think, because he was a rookie, I mean, like, brand new. Um, I think he was trying to do his best, right? I think, okay, what? This doesn't seem right. Um, why, is, why is he coming from, why is he in the white part of town? And, and, he, and he was in a beat-up car. Like, he wasn't in a nice car either. Um, so he wanted to talk to him, right? So he just pulled him over uh, based upon reasonable, what he thought was reasonable suspicion. But all he had really was race. And U.S. v. Weaver tells us that race can only be one factor, and it has to occur with many other factors, right? So that's kind of how that case played out. Um, yeah, and I think, again, in, the, in that case, I don't think he was trying to be racist. Um, he didn't have the background for it or anything like that. Um, he's legitimately a really nice guy. Um, I think he was just trying to do the best, but I think he was overzealous, right? Because, I mean, we're talking, this was like his first or second day on the job. So he was a little overzealous. Um, and, and he did the wrong thing, right? Um, unfortunately, his superior officers were in court to watch him testify because it was his first time in court, and, and when he broke down into tears, I immediately thought, like, oh, crap, I've just cost this man his job. But at the same time, the man made a legitimate mistake, but in that role, the role of a police officer, you shouldn't and can't make those types of mistakes, right? Because, again, racial issues are, are so difficult to deal with, um, and they still exist, right? That even the appearance of impropriety is enough uh, for us to, to um, take action. So that's kind of what happened in that case. So again, you can use race, but it just has to be one case, or one factor among many. Now, this leads us to the next question. Terry stops. Assuming we have reasonable suspicion, um, we can effectuate a Terry stop or stop and frisk. Terry stops are limited intrusions, remember this, that aren't rising to the level of an arrest. And the whole purpose is for officers to detect and investigate crime. Now, you would think, okay, this, this, this is enough, this makes sense, okay, I get it. Um, 
And not so much. Because we have to define what limited intrusions are, and then we have to think about the scope and the duration of a stop, right? So police must limit the scope and the duration of the stop to that necessary to effectuate a stop, right? So if we go beyond anything that's necessary to effectuate a Terry stop, it's, or if it rises basically to the level of a probable cause arrest, it's unreasonable under the Fourth Amendment and it may trigger the exclusionary rule. So um, when we're assessing the reasonableness of a Terry stop, we really look to three things. First is movement. Second is length of detention. Third is intrusiveness slash techniques employed, right? So um, right off the bat, movement, again, Terry stop, you should be just free. You're not free to leave, but you know, you, 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 you have a little room, right? Um, if an officer put handcuffs on you or orders you to put your hands on the car and not move, there's two different possibilities here, right? Um, they put handcuffs on you. We're looking at, it looks like a probable cause arrest. And so we have to have a probable cause. And if we don't, then the exclusionary rule is triggered. Um, if officer tells you to put your hands on the vehicle, now the officer is using a show of force, which tells us that that's detention, um, by ordering you to put your hands on your vehicle so they can pat you down. Um, that's fine. If they order you to put your hands on the vehicle and they make you wait 40 minutes after they've pat you down with your hands on the vehicle, well, then we're gonna say that doesn't seem reasonable, right? That's not enough to detect and investigate crime. You were doing something else. The other thing that we look at is length of detention. And I kind of mentioned that when we were talking about movement. Um, length of detention, uh, basically the longer a Terry stop lasts, the more likely we're gonna say it's unreasonable um, because it's just supposed to be a brief investigatory stop, right? Just a brief stop. So if officers have you like kind of cornered and they're talking to you for two hours and you're not free to go, that's gonna be unreasonable, right? Five minutes, probably reasonable, but it just depends on what they're investigating. Um, you know, if you're investigating a homicide or you think somebody's about to kill somebody, you're probably gonna talk to them longer than if you think somebody um, has outstanding parking tickets, right? And so we also look at intrusiveness and the techniques employed. So if you're in a car, did police pull you over and do what's called the, 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 the felony stop. Right, felony stop is where they have the guns drawn, they order you out of the vehicle, have your hands up, get on your knees, and you lock your fingers between the back of your head, and then they go up, they cuff you, then they search you, right? Um, so is it a felony stop? Because if so, that is really intrusive, right? Um, and is it necessary? Keep that in mind. Is it necessary to effectuate a, a brief stop to detect and investigate crime? Um, well, the answer for that one is usually, I mean, no, right? Like that's, it's not necessary, uh, but maybe sometimes it is. You know, if the, if the person has a record of shooting at police, well, and they're doing something suspicious, well, maybe we could say that's necessary, but that's a tough sell, right? And again, that's part of the reason why we generally just pat down the outside of people's clothing. We don't generally go into pockets unless we have a reason. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Massachusetts has a different rule than a lot of other states when it comes to that. But we're looking at, did the officers just pat you down or did the officers like strip you down? Right? One is probably reasonable and necessary. The other is probably not. Um, so just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Now, if we want to look at kind of this broken down. So a subject, let's say that 
we stop somebody, right? They may only be subjected to what's called a modest movement during a Terry stop as required to protect the public, the suspect, and or the police, right? So the idea here is, can the police stop you and say, okay, you, you know, we need to go over here to have our conversation? It has to be a modest movement. And if it's not modest, if, if we're going a long way, then we're gonna say that it's not reasonable and, and the Terry stop is gonna probably be thrown out. Um, but it's just modest movement to protect the suspect, um, the public and the police. So how do we judge this? We judge this again under the totality of the circumstances. However, there is one area or one thing that is almost always unreasonable. And that's police dominated locations. So if you move somebody to a police dominated location, we're generally gonna say that's unreasonable, right? Um, so think about if, if we move somebody to um, a, the, a police headquarters, right? We say, yeah, let's, let's go down to the headquarters and we'll just talk. Um, you're not under arrest, you know, but, but we just need to talk. Um, that's police dominated, right? That's not a modest movement uh, by any means. Uh, So then the question is, is there a bright line rule as to when um, or how far uh, we can move somebody, right? Like have them move. Um, Florida versus Royer is an interesting one. It's a 1983 case. Uh, so in this case, uh, basically, uh, this took place at the Miami National International Airport. Um, this guy fit what was called the drug courier profile. So he was casually dressed. He was a nervous young man carrying heavy luggage. He paid cash for his ticket. And he filled out that his baggage tag only with a name and destination. So they're undercover officers at the airport and they're like, yeah, this guy, he fits that the drug courier profile. So the officers identified themselves and they asked if they could speak with him, right? And he said, yes, he consented. So this is kind of a, they didn't show any force at this point, right? But he consented and at the request produced his airline ticket and his driver's license. He then became visibly nervous when the officers noted that the ticket and the driver's license bore different names. And then they told him they suspected him of transporting narcotics, right? So, he originally agrees to talk to the police, right? So there's an encounter because they ask, can we talk to you? And he's like, yeah. And he gives them his ticket and his driver's license and, and, and there's no real show of force. It's, it's, it's all voluntary. Um, when they tell him they suspect him of transporting drugs and they see that he gets nervous and that his ticket and his, his driver's license don't match, is that gonna be reasonably suspicious? Yeah. Look at that. That's suspicious. Again, we don't have to have 51%. We're only talking 15 to 25%. Um, sure, we have to have some reason why we believe this. So um, without returning his ticket or his license, they asked him to accompany them to a small room off the concourse, right? So basically just a little, a little office off the um, main concourse. Uh, he said nothing in response, but went with him. And then without his consent, they retrieved his luggage and brought it to the room. When asked if he would consent to a search of his suitcase, again, he did not speak, but handed the officers a key. When the officers opened the suitcase, they had discovered it contained a ridiculous amount of marijuana. Um, so that all sounds like he went willingly along with it, right? But, and here's the big but. Um, when they approached the officer, or when they approached Royer in the airport, they did it correctly, right? But they moved him without his consent 
to that small office. Right? He didn't say anything, but they moved him. So we, uh, implying that he didn't consent to it, to his that small office. That office was 40 feet away, right? 40 feet, not that long. There's, you know, we're going in this office. And then, of course, then we, we get into the issue of um, how do we know it wasn't necessarily a, a consensual encounter? Um, because they didn't return his ticket or his license, right? If they gave him his ticket and his license back and said, hey, you won't come with us in this room, just ask you some more questions, that would still be completely voluntary. But they had his license and they had his ticket. So would a reasonable person feel free to leave? Um, no. Like, what are you supposed to do without a driver's license? What are you supposed to do without a ticket and an airport, right? So would he feel free to leave? No. Um, so that becomes a Terry stop as soon as they don't return him his license and his ticket and then move him to the office. Again, the Supreme Court says this 40 foot movement was unreasonable. It violated his rights. Right, so when we say you can only move somebody like minutely, we mean minutely, like 50, 40 feet, that was too far. Uh, but again, we, we do it under the totality of the circumstances. Uh, don't we be in New York, the suspect confessed after he was transported to police headquarters on suspicion of murder. Again, we have to apply to the circumstances, say, okay, this is a lot more severe crime, um, but we're taking this person to a police-dominated location, police headquarters, right? So is that unreasonable? And the court wrestles with that. We also look at Cop versus Texas, 2003 case, uh, murder suspect in underwear was awoken at 3 a.m., handcuffed, taken to the scene of a crime, and then taken to the station in his underwear. Um, so basically, police suspect this guy of committing murder, SWAT team kicks down the door, cuffs him in his bed at 3 a.m., takes him with, in his underwear still, they don't even allow him to put on pants, to a murder scene. And then they take him to the crimes, to the, to the, to the, the, the police station, right? Um, so this raises several questions. Uh, was this a Terry stop or was this uh, an arrest? When we first look at it, uh, it feels like a Terry stop, or excuse me, it feels like an arrest, right? Um, uh, because uh, uh, again, um, they, they did put handcuffs on him Right, they removed him from his home. They actually advised him of his Miranda rights. And then he gives the police officers a written statement. Um, now, what's important to know here is that officers tried but failed to get a warrant to question Cop. Um, after waking Cop, the officers identified themselves, said, you know, okay, we need to talk. He said, okay. Um, of course, then he was transported, all that jazz. Um, Now, uh, COP was interesting um, in the sense that um, this is just a weird visual, one. And two, uh, the court said that the police officers exemplified the probative circumstances that indicated a seizure, even when the person being seized does not attempt to leave. Um, so basically they said, okay, this was not necessarily a Terry stop, right? Um, because they, off, they had a threatening presence. There were several officers that displayed weapons. There was physical touching, uh, the use of language and tone, compliance with officer's request, et cetera. Uh, and basically the court held that the defense's res defendant's response of okay when asked if they he would go with them. Um, was no showing of consent under the circumstances because he was presented with no option but to go with the officers, right? And so doing so was nothing near, uh, nothing more than just a mere submission of a claim to lawful authority, right? So this one is a, a like this one is is one that's just obvious, right? Um, 
3 a.m., handcuffed, taken to the crime scene for whatever reason, which is always a really bad idea. You take my homicide investigation class, we're going to talk about why that's a really bad idea, and then taken to the station, all in his underwear. Is that a brief investigatory stop? No. Right? I mean, that, that, that's just a plain no. That, 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 that is clearly an arrest. So do we also look at the length of detention during a Terry stop? So again, Terry stops have to be um, brief. They, we, we don't allow long stops. Um, most Terry stops only last a few minutes. So if you look at the New York Police Department handbook that I've posted off for you, um, it'll, it tells you exactly, it's a manual basically of, of how to conduct a, a, a Terry stop. Now, that being said, scholars and advocates, right, say a Terry stop should last no more than 20 minutes. Right? That's what like legal scholars say. It's 20 minutes, anything beyond that, it's an arrest, it's unreasonable, etc. cetera. Um, but the Supreme Court has rejected a hard line, right? That has rejected saying 20 minutes is, 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 if it's 21 minutes, that's unreasonable. The Supreme Court hasn't done that. Instead, the Supreme Court says reasonableness is determined by the, guess what, totality of the circumstances. So we looked at U.S. v. Sharp. Um, we looked and saw that a 20-minute delay between a stop and backup coming um, was permissible because there was no undue delay. So basically, guy yeah, gets stopped, officer requests backup, and the backup comes immediately. The backup doesn't like pull four cars over and then goes and gets a drink at the gas station and all that jazz and then comes, right? Um, he, the backup came immediately. So they're saying, look, there's no undue delay, the, you know, just because the police weren't in the same physical location, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't change really anything. Um, then, on the other hand, we had United States versus Place. It was a 1983 case, so a year before U.S. v. Sharp. In this case, it dealt with a 90-minute delay. Um, basically, they had to get the canine narcotics dog to LaGuardia Airport. Um, I don't know if you've ever flown out of LaGuardia. Like, I always go to JFK. I, I really don't recommend LaGuardia. Um, but it, like it's it, it's an international airport. I mean, and it's a busy, just like JFK, a very busy international airport. So you'll see police with dogs all the time there. And this is part of their like. And, and again, this is pre nine eleven and stuff like that. But this was still times that were cracking down on drugs, right? Um, and the Supreme Court was almost baffled. They're like, why the hell wasn't the canine, the drug sniffing canine? at the airport, like you have more than one, like why? Um, and so again, they said, look, it's unreasonable because the officer, the canine wasn't there. You had to wait 90 minutes and then the canine shows up and then they proceeded to, to, to go down that path. So 90 minutes was unreasonable, but again, we're looking at the characteristics of, of, of probable cause arrest versus um, a Terry stop. Then we have, which is like one of my favorite cases, United States versus Montoya de Hernandez, a 1985 case. So this case, um, basically they held this person, they seized this person who they thought was a drug smuggler for 24 hours. Right, and the reason that they were waiting 24 hours is because they they believed that she was um, had drugs inside her. Right, so it's not uncommon for people going across the border if they're drug offenders um, to put like cocaine um, or other things into like balloons, tie up the balloon and swallow it. 
And the idea is because of the latex and stuff like that, your stomach acid doesn't dissolve it and, and, and it passes, right? And when it passes in a bowel movement, then you dig through your bowel movement and get the balloons and then you've smuggled them over the border. That's what they thought she did, right? And so they're like, okay, fine. We have reason to believe, and again, in this case, they had uh, reasonable suspicion that this person was a, a drug smuggler. And so they effectuated a Terry stop. Now they did place her in a, like a holding room. So you could argue like that seems like an arrest, um, but they didn't like do much beyond that. They just sat there and waited till she had to have a bowel movement. Um, and then she had a bowel movement and the police went through the bowel movement. Like who wants, like who got that job is one I question I want to know. It was like, did the like rookie get it? Like who, who are going to say like, Hey, here's a big pile of poop. Why don't you go through it and find balloons? Um, that statement in itself is just insane, but who had to do this? Um, but that being said, they, they go through, they find the drugs. Um, and the Supreme Court said, look, under the circumstances, their, their Terry stop, right, because it was an investigatory stop, right, we're trying, and we had reasonable suspicion, and we're trying to see if um, you um, have drugs, right, was reasonable, even though they held her for uh, 24 hours. So again, this is where the, the, the Supreme Court looks at each case individually and says totality of the circumstances, right? Legal scholars and, and advocates, they want a 20 minute max. Supreme Court's never said a 20 minute max. Um, sometimes they've allowed 20 minutes and then not 90 minutes, but then they allow 24 hours. So it's very situation dependent. And then we look at the investigative techniques during a Terry stop. So techniques employed during a Terry stop have to be the quote, least intrusive means reasonable, reasonably available to verify or dispel the officer's suspicion in a short period of time. And so what this generally says is basically like the more threat this person poses to the officers, the public, evidence, whatever, the more intrusive the techniques that are permitted. Now, how do we judge if a technique used by the police officers during a Terry stop is um, reasonable? Guess what? We look at the totality of the circumstances again. Um, so we look at things like uh, the number of officers and the number of suspects. All right, so if you have, if you're doing a Terry stop and there's one suspect and there's 10 officers there, we're probably going to say that's unreasonable. That looks like an arrest, right? You need probable cause. We're also going to look at the nature of the crime that's being um, committed or, or, or alleged. Um, so, you know, is it a minor crime? Is it a major crime? Like, if we're talking homicide, besides like the, the underwear guy, like, we're going to give you a little bit more leash than we're going to give you for simple possession of marijuana. All right, if that's what you suspect. Um, so make sure the crime suspected, um, whether there's reason to believe the suspect is armed, right? Does the suspect appear armed? Did you see a firearm? Does the suspect have firearm offenses, et cetera, right? And we're gonna allow you to be more protective of yourself and, and others if you think the person is armed. Then we have the immediate need for protection. So this could be a felony stop and this could actually be handcuffing um, if there's immediate action taken, right? And then as soon as the danger disappears, they have to take the handcuffs off. Otherwise, we're talking, this looks like an arrest, right? Uh, threatening behavior by the suspect. So if the suspect is threatening, um, then we're just kind of where we're at. <clears throat> and the opportunity to make it less intrusive. So this is Florida versus Royer again, right? Um, is there a way to make it a less intrusive technique? And then if so, then that's what you should have done. Um, 
And again, it implicates Florida versus Rory. That's not what it stands for. Then we bring us down to Hibble versus the Sixth Judicial Circuit or District. This is a 2004 case and deals with stop and identify. And basically what it did is it held that statute, Nevada had a statute. Basically it's, the police can stop you and ask you to show your, your license or identify yourself, right? And again, this was largely to target illegal immigrants or, or undocumented persons because um, no person is illegal, they're just undocumented. Um, so this was a stop and identify, right? So basically the Supreme Court holds that in, in, in this case that statutes requiring suspects to uh, disclose their names during police Terry stops do not violate the Fourth Amendment if, if the statute first required reasonable and articulated articulable suspicion of criminal activity, right? So we say that this is a minimal intrusive stop because all we're asking you to do is identify who you are. But even though we're just stopping you to ask you to identify who you are, we still have to have reasonable suspicion that a crime is afoot, right? Um, if you just see somebody walking down the street in um, the Southwest, and they appear of Hispanic descent, that's not enough, right? If they start running, we'll look at then we've got reasonable suspicion, but uh, that's not enough. And that's kind of what we, we're, we're dealing with here. Um, stop and identify, you still have that right uh, to be free from a reasonable intrusion. Now, I will say this, um, generally speaking, people have asked me in classes before, if an officer wants to see my ID, do I have to give it to him? And this is true in like a, if, if it's a stop and identify situation as well. Um, the answer is yes, unless it would implicate your Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. So most of the time, um, when we're thinking about like self-incrimination or, or, or whatnot, um, giving your ID is not going to do it. The one time that I would argue that it is self-incrimination is if you're trespassing on land, right? So we know that this land is owned by John Doe. John Doe is of a certain race and height and weight and all that, and you are a different race, height, and weight, um, and we say produce your license. At that point, you are telling them, making a statement, right? Um, and that statement is a criminal statement. Uh, so that's one ca one caveat that, that that has been interesting that we, we we've kind of seen courts struggle with. But really, we're talking if the the the, the police um, want to stop and identify you, um, that's completely fine. But they have to have reasonable suspicion of a crime. Um, when we talk about frisks, uh, again, officers may conduct a frisk when uh, nothing in the initial encounter serves to dispel an officer's reasonable fear for his safety or the safety of others. So what this means is the suspect has to be given the opportunity to dispel fears, right? Um, so officer has to say, are you armed? They can't just assume and it has to be reasonable, right? They got the guy in the underwear. Are they really gonna be that reasonably afraid of the guy in underwear, like in just underwear? Um, there's probably no reasonable fear there, but there is for whatever reason, maybe you think he's hiding something in his backside, you have to give him or her the opportunity to dispel the officer's fears before you take action before you begin the frisk. Right? So again, it's stop and frisk. Stop is one part of it. Frisk is like a whole other part of it. Um, so relevant factors we consider are um, bulges in pockets, furtive gesture. So furtive gesture is something that's like a suspicious gesture. So you see like you're around the corner and see a police officer and you immediately put your hands in your pockets. That's a furtive gesture. 
suspects past, right? So are they, have they, do they have a violent past? Do they have a violent criminal activity history? Are they suspected of a criminal activity that's violent? Are they in a high crime area? Is it night? Are there others around, right? And so we take all these into account um, when we say, does the person have a reasonable fear, right? If you're a high crime area at night, the person has a criminal history and you're suspecting that he just killed some guy, that's a reasonable fear. You start to be like, hey, you know, do you have a weapon or um, you know, put your hands up or whatever um, to dispel that fear. But if that fear is not dispelled during the initial encounter, they can frisk you. Now, generally speaking, frisks are limited to outer clothing, but officers may reach inside, including any containers inside your pockets or your coat or whatever, if officers reasonably believe they feel a weapon, all right? So the whole point of this is to protect safety. Remember the plain field doctrine applies. So if they, they have to immediately know that it's a weapon, right? They pat you down, have to immediately know it's a weapon. However, while they're patting you down, if they find something, they feel something that they basically immediately know is drugs, they can go into your pockets, pull out the drugs, and, and charge you with them. Now, Massachusetts, their law under their constitution, state police and local police and, and all that jazz, um, can only search for weapons. Right, so if they pat you down, they find a weapon, they'll take it until they're done talking to you if it's legal, um, if it's not, then you're getting arrested. Uh, but if they pat you down and they feel what feels like drugs, like they just know it's drugs, right? It's like a dime bag, it's full of powder, like they know. Massachusetts says no. Officers cannot go into your pockets and retrieve it. Right? They, because, for Massachusetts' sake, the whole point of a frisk is just to make sure that the person is not a threat to the officer himself or others. Right, so feeling of drugs, that's not permitted in Massachusetts. Most other states, if they feel drugs or something else they know immediately is um, illegal, then they can go ahead and reach into your pockets and search that way. So it's not just limited to the outer clothing um, unless they reasonably believe they feel a weapon, plain field doctrine applies, and again, usually we're talking drugs. Um, I'll go through this one fairly, fairly quickly. Uh, Terry stops during routine traffic stop. Uh, so we can conduct a Terry stop on a vehicle um, as long as the investigation does not unreasonably extend the stop. Right? Uh, we limit ourselves to those techniques reasonably necessary. So generally promote personal safety. Officers may order drivers out of passengers or passengers to exit a vehicle without reasonable suspicion. This is called an exit order. Some states, again, Massachusetts, provide more protections via their state constitutions. So they require a reasonable belief that safety is in danger before you can issue an exit order. Right? Other states say, and the, the Supreme Court has allowed officers to order drivers out of a vehicle without reasonable suspicion. So if an officer orders you out of your vehicle, in most states, just get out. Like even in Massachusetts, they're not going to, but in Massachusetts, get out. Uh, follow the officer's instructions. Um, because even if they don't have reasonable suspicion, they can still do it, make sure that they're safe. Now they may, what's funny is frisk a car for weapons only upon a reasonable belief that the suspect is dangerous and may gain access to the weapon. So when they order somebody out, they can go and they can look in general places, like in, generally, and, and open some containers and things like that um, for a weapon. How is that any different than a search incident to arrest, right? Because then again, Terry, stop, you're not arrested. We're just, we're just talking to you. We're just, you know, investigating things. Um, but they can search your vehicle. Well, guess what? Um, if they find anything in your vehicle while they'll do their frisk, 
plain view, plain feel, whatever it is, they can charge you with it. Right? So you can frisk a car even if the person is not near the car. It's a really kind of weird caveat, um, but it's one the officers do use, right? Like if, if, if it's in their arsenal, they're gonna use it. Uh, that being said, traffic stops may be Terry stops as well. So in other words, police can initiate a traffic stop based upon probable cause, that's usually the standard, or reasonable suspicion, right? So probable cause would be the officer clocks you speeding on his radar gun, right? That's probable cause. Reasonable suspicion is the officer sees you drive by and you're going, well, it looks like pretty fast. Well, they can stop you, right? Because again, it's a 15 to 25%, like sure that you're doing something wrong. Um, so you can be stopped based on, on, on um, reasonable suspicion. Again, that's why you never, ever, ever answer the question, do you know how fast you were going or do you know why I pulled you over? Because as soon as you admit to it, you're getting the ticket. If you don't admit to it and all they have is reasonable suspicion, you're not getting a ticket. And if you are, it, it's getting thrown out in court. So that's why you never, ever, ever, ever answer the question, how fast were you going or do you know why I pulled you over? Play ignorant, play dumb, because they might not have probable cause, they might only have reasonable suspicion, and to give you a ticket, they need probable cause, right? And as soon as you admit to it, you give them the probable cause. So the next lecture we'll look at next class will be arrests and arrest procedures. Thank you so much for listening and I look forward to our next class.